the loudest little 12 year old on the block the first dozen years of q104 part four making waves hi this is tommy lee from motley crew and you're listening to dr feelgood on q104 darmouth the rock of the atlantic okay, it's dart milk. oh dartmouth okay dartmouth okay sorry about that everybody <laughs> Hi, this is Tommy Lee from Motley Crue, and you're listening to Dr. Feelgood on Q104, Dartmouth, the rock of the Atlantic. So crank it up! Yeah, this is Duff with Guns N' Roses. You listen to Q104, classic rock. Uh, if they play us, I don't know how classic it is, but <laughs> I was just joking. Keep rocking, you guys. As program director, Jake Edwards had a tendency to hire characters over straight, generic announcers, giving the Q104 on-air lineup a very colorful sound. Jane, Jane Fontel was interesting, and just a, another flight package that really didn't ground all that much. Never touched down on, on the ground all that much, but that's what... That's what made her so incredible on the air. I mean, it's it just, you know, you have to go back to those times and, and, and surround yourself with that time to make that package work. I mean, that package may not work today, uh, but back then it did. And she was, she was, she was funny. And, and a, just to watch her go, you just let people do what they wanted to do. I mean, obviously, the more, the more fucked up you were mentally, the better you sounded on the air. Time. We have a couple of birthdays today. Actually, one that we want to mention. Yane has the, the scan. Tennis star Borg was Bjorn today. 28 years old. Happy birthday, Bjorn. A few fog patches early this morning. Sunshine. Some coastal fog developing this afternoon. Highs of 21. Winds from the southwest, 15 knots today and tonight. And it is 13 right now on the Q104 FM roof, which is kind of ridiculous because nobody's up there, but it is uh, basically 12 or 13 down below, too. Down on the ground, and on the bridge, and Wise Road. What's this? Billy Bob's theme. Yeah, I thought we'd play it just because I missed the guy, and it's been uh, away for a little yeah. while. Just, you know, get everybody in the mood and remind everybody that he is the tool of the Atlantic. Billy Bob. Billy, Billy, Billy Bob. And mainly because I didn't have a record queued up and thought I'd play this for filler. Sackville Horns. Brother Jake learned the hard way in his first programming gig at Q104 what he calls his number one rule of recruiting talent. Never hire anybody sight unseen. Ever. Ever. Never, never, never do that. This guy, who we nicknamed Blind Bart, shows up at the radio station, and I remember telling him over the phone, I said, you can drive, right? Oh, yeah, I can drive. You got a license? Oh, oh yeah. So the secretary called up and said, Jake, I think you should come out here right away. Uh, you know the guy you hired who was in Montreal? Yes, he's here. Really? So I go out and I see him. First of all, his clothes are really, really dirty. He's got two different colored socks on. He's got gravy stains that you, if you connected them, probably would have a character of Howdy Doody on his chest. Just smelling, stinky, greasy. I went, I put my hand out to shake his hand, and he missed me by 10 feet. And I'm going, oh my God, now this guy drives? This guy couldn't get a sled dog team, a dog sled team, in a parade, a Q104 parade, with C&I dogs all hooked up to the sled to get him to the end of the parade. And Arnie is wondering exactly who I'm hiring. So as we're walking by Arnie Patterson's office, which at that time had a lot of glass in it, Blind Bard had the hands walking across the glass just so he could kind of guide himself down to my office. Performing and operating on air can be difficult for a vision-impaired person, and in Blind Bard's case, difficult for his co-workers. Doug Caldwell explains. So he was like about 80, 90 percent blind, and when he read copy, I mean, the paper was two inches away from his face. How he even knew where the buttons were on the board, I don't know. And, of course, we were using vinyl back then. So, I mean, for him to try and find the groove on an album was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So, anyway, I came in, I came cruising up to the station about 11.30, and I rolled around the corner, walked past the window. I could see him in there. And all I could see was the place was a mess. It was a mess. So I took a deep breath, walked inside, and hey, what the fuck? 
Oh my God, this guy had raisins and grapes all over the place. He had food, little bits of food all over the board. When he picked up the vinyl, I mean, he didn't pick it up by the edge. I mean, he just put his fingerprints all over it, man. And it was, the albums were out of sleeves everywhere. Me being a bit of a, an audiophile and an old a vinyl aholic, this was like, oh, this is blasphemy. How, geez, my God. So I went to um, start picking up my songs for the show. And I'm getting really antsy. I mean, I just really want to rip right into this guy and just say, but I didn't. So um, I went to pick out my songs, and he, oh, here, hang a second, I'll give you the cards. And we picked out of an old card, uh, like a card file system. And uh, he went to hand them to me, and he dropped every single one of them on the floor. And these things were all in categories and all in a rotating system. So once you dropped them on the floor, you completely screwed up the entire rotation system. And he did that. I had to, I had to basically put that all back together. Uh, get all the LPs back inside the sleeves in order, alphabetically and numerically, and clean up the master control board all while I was first on the air. <laughs> this is terrible because I can't remember the man's name, but Blind Bart, if that sounds so politically incorrect, doesn't it? Almost cruel. Well, he was in radio. <laughs> this guy was legally blind. He sent us a demo tape. He sounded great doing news out of Montreal set of pipes he could read apparently he was using a braille machine which we didn't have here and he was hired to do a jock shift all I know is he wound it up on the radio station doing weekends and all nights or whatever handling the, the, the library I just ordered on clean pristine vinyl this guy is mitt marking every piece of vinyl that, that came out of the sleeve in there God love him I mean he was doing his best you should have saw him you should have seen him queue up a record Oh, the worst cue burn of it. And then you pick it up and say, I just put this in here yesterday, and it's mitt from one side, from label to, to edge. It's just nothing but mitt. So I kept freaking out to Jake. I'd say, listen, we got to do something. He can't keep handling the albums. He said, get him some gloves. Get him some gloves. So I went out, and I bought him a bulk, a bag of like 144 pair of white cotton gloves. So that's cool. This is going on about eight weeks now. He's got the white gloves happening. I'm still finding mitt marks on the music. So I make a point of being up here some Saturday afternoon when Buddy's on. I walk in. Here he is. He's got the label right up to the tip of his nose, right? With this pair of gloves that had to have been as black as coal. What are you doing? Well, I got my gloves on. Get a new pair throw them out you've got 144 pairs if you retired from here you wouldn't use them all like use them we'll buy them okay <laughs> we got so then bob catches them with the gloves on eating pizza i mean there was no stopping this guy and i think there was another guy there was a news guy who used to walk on stilts right the q cowboy i hire him again over the phone so he comes in and, and, and he had his legs you know they were they were amputated you know, and he had, he had, he had like the little stilt ends on the end, right? And he used to walk with braces. You know, you'd have the, you'd have the crutches, and and a great guy, really, a, just a peach of a guy, and I loved him. I mean, these are the characters we've got on the air. So I remember him coming into the newsroom, and Arnie was there, and I said, Arnie, I'd like to, like you to meet your new news director at Q104. So the Q cowboy shakes a crutch off, reaches out to shake his hand. One of the stilts let go. He hits the top of a Remington typewriter. His blood is gushing out of his forehead. He's on his back, and he goes, how do you like me now? And Arnie went, Jake, what are you doing? What's going on here? So now we've got the blind, the blind Melon Chitlin and the cute cowboy together, and they're, in, they're working a Sunday morning show. And, of course, Blind Melon can't see the volume to the headphone level that the cute cowboy's getting, and it was so loud. The cute cowboy had shrieking going through the mic. You can imagine what kind of noise that was. And yells out, Jesus Christ, on the air. And the feedback. And they're having, it's, it's, it's a fight. It's the Hatfield and the McCoys on the air. So I get in the car from Lawrencetown Beach. I'm driving down the road at about 150 miles an hour. I get in there. I go, what the hell is going on? And they're just about ready to kill each other on the air. And there'd be dead air for like five, ten minutes, then back on. And then he'd go, okay, here's the news. 
and you wouldn't hear anything, and all of a sudden you hear, ah! Jesus! The guy, he got feedback in his headphones, and he'd be cursing at him over the air, and it was just a riot, man. I can't remember the number of times I was in the other room working, and we the, the show would be on the air, and it would go dead, and we'd look in, and Jim would be there like doing one of these, hitting buttons, trying to get back on the air. Well, that was the radio I used to like listening to. Absolute chaos. So, anyway, the Q Cowboy and Blind Melon Chitlin ride again. Yeah, thing still to come this hour. Some lucky listener will win a monogrammed whammy gram delivered by Leon Spinks to your nose, a home. <laughs> uh, and I'll be revealing the name of a wino here in town who lives out behind the Burger King in the bushes. All right. That's true. Look That's still to come. To that. But now we're going to seatbelt ourselves in. Oh, no. Strap your headphones on, Hal. People up in Forest Hills... People out in Lower Sackville, Halifax, Dartmouth, Jador Bay, Chesacook. Jador Priest. Is that who this is? This is Jador Priest. How did you know? It's like she. Just so like smart, like man. This is Judas Priest, Frank, on Q104. <laughs> when you feel safe. Attitude played a large role in projecting Q104's image to the city. The bold and cocky nature of the young Q jocks was never more dangerous than when they took it to the streets and took on the competition head to head. I remember one time when we were trying to get things going and Q104 tried to present a lot of the concerts and it was really tough for us to do because Chum, you know, C100 and CJCH really had the market covered. They'd been there, they were the heritage radio stations and it was really tough for us to get a show but coming from out west I had some contacts and C-100 was presenting Billy Idol with CJCH. It was a co-presents. And I remember David Wolf, who was a program director at CJCH at the time, and Barry Horn. And I went on the air and I said, by the way, we've got a tat-a-tat close-up with Billy Idol because he's coming to the subway as Q-104 presents the Billy Idol party. So they had a lineup right around the block, and David Wolf and Barry Horn were in the lineup saying the show's been canceled give us your you know forget it leave the show has been canceled trying to trying to wreck our party well of course billy and i were out partying <laughs> i remember him dancing on tables at the subway oh yeah no, another brother jake spectacular <laughs> we're at the misty moon street heart is on stage presented by c100 we're not even on the air yet so Jake is good friends with uh, Street Heart from Winnipeg. And all the C-100 jocks are running around, and I'm kind of in the wing. And I knew Kenny Shields, the lead singer, would invite me up, and he did. So I go up, and here is Barry Horn and everybody going, What the hell is he doing on stage? We, had, we weren't even opened yet. And I get, I get on the mic and went, Thanks, Kenny. And by the way, you know, the greatest rock station ever to hit this area will be open next month. Q104, the Rock of the Atlantic. Remember it. And I remember Barry Horn was sinking right through the floor. I said, here they are now. Q104 presents Street Heart. They went into action, you know, and the next day, it was like another front page of the entertainment section. Brother Jake at Q104, steel show right under C100's nose. <laughs> that was pretty good. So here we have all these C100 radio personalities. They're at the club. Because they're really going, hey, we've got, we've got to hold our own, and uh, we're presenting these shows. And so I'm standing around. I, I knew a couple of them, and uh, then I, I see, I see Rock and Ray <laughs> wandering around, um, slapping people on the back. Hi, how are you? Right, little slap on the back, and he's got these Q104 stickers. So he's saying hi to everyone from C100, of course. So you have all these C100 people walking around with Q104 stickers on their back. Deeper. And for Wood Motors Ford, they're out there somewhere in traffic. Hal Harbor, and I think Yane might be with them. No, Yane's not with me yet. She's still on her way into the station here, Yake. But ah. know, it is uh, D-Day, the 40th anniversary of that famous day when the troops got their boots all wet and invaded the, the Normandy coast. But uh, we're doing something a little bit different today. It is Q-Day, and today 4 million Q104 listeners are going to be 
converging on our competition with makeshift bazookas and whipped cream pies. They'll be uh, storming the CF100 Yahoo Studios and spraying all the guys down over there with Hoagie's Kickaboo Hoo Joy Juice. And it should be some fun as we celebrate Q Day here in Halifax and Dartmouth. In traffic on Q Day, I'm Al Harbor for Wood Motors Ford in the Q Mobile Jeep Half Track. <laughs> Nine minutes after 7 o'clock, 7.09, Q104 FM, the Rock of the Atlantic. Nine degrees, it's another fine day. Going to be a beauty today. And wouldn't it be nice to go in, say, maybe on board a 43 or 44-foot CNC sailboat and cruise out in the harbor on a beautiful day like this? We're going to give you that chance. We're going to be looking for six to eight people for a champagne breakfast during the tall ships. And you will be aboard the Q104 Ice House Lounge CNC Cruiser. It's Al Harbor here, live from the Q Copter. And as you know, it's a Rocket Ray's birthday today, so I'm going to be uh, flying out to uh, McNabb's Island out there and airlifting a 104-ton rock from the Atlantic. And I'll be dropping it down here on the Q104 balcony and... Uh, all the Q staff are going to be uh, spray painting little birthday greetings and weird kind of graffiti all over it. So when Ray comes in this morning around 9 o'clock or so, he will be some surprised you. It's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it. I'm Hal Harbor in a Q copter for Wood Motors Ford. The $8 million sticker price sale continues at Wood Motors Ford. New vehicles are arriving daily, and they're selling at the lowest possible prices. Wood Motors Ford. Where else, well, guy? Guy, yeah. Sporting Chance. 12 after 7 o'clock. I bought some lotto tickets the other day, and uh, I don't usually buy them. I thought for sure there was something that told me. It said, dummy, you're going to win. I thought maybe three and a half million would have been mine, and I, I would have taken all the people that listen to me. There must be 50 of you out there. I would have taken you all on a trip to Bermuda. That's the type of guy I am. You know what I mean? No messing around, Reverend. That's the type of guy I am. That's true. Three and a half million dollars, I would have taken you and 49 other listeners. How many million dollars? Three and a half million. Where'd you buy these tickets? I didn't get... Well, I bought them at a corner store. Didn't, I'm you didn't have, win? I didn't win, no. What the hell are you talking to me for now, then? <laughs> well, I bet you you'd be my friend if I had three and a half million. You'd be right over here quick, I bet. But then... Wouldn't you? I, I don't think so. You don't Money think so? Money has nothing to do with it. I love your personality. Thank your you. Your looks. Thank you. The love that exudes from your heart. Thank you. Yeah, but I'm a big liar. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> We're going to do something for you right now. It's uh, called weather. And the weather, you're just getting up, and people say, how come you say the weather so much? Well, do you realize that every second of the morning, another Q listener tunes in and gets up, wants to hear the weather. Here it is for all you late risers. Get the hell out of bed. 13 minutes after 7 o'clock. We're going up to 18, and it's 9 right now at the Q Zoo Good Morning Show. 17 minutes after 7 o'clock, 717. Brother Jake, Hal Harbor, Jane Fondle, and the Reverend Jeremiah G. Wright just wants a whip it good. Devo from Q104 FM. A whip it good. <laughs> whip it good. Down the mountain back. Just about 20 minutes after 7 o'clock, 20 after 7, Q104. The good morning show of the 1984 Summer Games. and We've been asked to uh, pull out of the Summer Games, but we're not going to because we're not commun communist infiltrated, and we feel very socialistic and... Uh, no way. No Olympus Interruptus for that, us. That Olympus Interruptus. I like it. That's very good. <laughs> oh, here's a seal pup. Oh, watch it. Watch it. Oh, he's excited. Randy. He's excited. Slow down now. Seal 100. Here he is. Bad-mouthing the competition on the air was new to Nova Scotia, but Jake Edwards made it routine on Q104. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. They hated it because they weren't allowed to do it. That's what made it a sport. Because, you know, they weren't allowed to do it. So we would do it not to, not to be pompous or, or to, uh, you know, piss on our, our certain fire hydrant. Of course, we were doing that too, but it was just to, just to even fantasize about those guys over there going on, those bastards. We'd like to say the same thing, but of course, you know, the Chum Group and all the other radio stations weren't allowed to do it. And, you know, coming from out west and, and that being a sport out there, it was, it was a natural thing to do. 
I encouraged it, actually, with uh, all the jocks. Well, what, what, what do you think we should do? <laughs> and piss on them. <laughs> they say all's fair in love and war. And in the Halifax radio wars, the battle was occasionally fought off the air and behind enemy lines. Jake Edwards and Arnie Patterson reminisce. I think the best one we ever pulled off was CJCH and C-100. They kind of turned a blind eye to us and a deaf ear. And they didn't believe we were real for one second. And that's what they told all their clients, of course. But, you know, the first BBM book that came out, they knew right away that we were a real rock and roll entity. Never mind rock and roll. We were an entity. We were servicing people they had never touched before. And the reason why they listened to C-100, because it was the only game in town. There was no rock and roll. You'd go to maybe Huey Lewis or a melon camp. That would be it. Brother Jake uh, had a little different uh, style of dealing with competition than I would have uh, certainly uh, uh, promoted. And I remember getting together with Arnie Patterson and going over the dumping of the 10-ton rock. Brother Jake and uh, Hell Harbor and J.C. Douglas and the other younger guys uh, on Q were always up to something. They always had some sort of a weird promotion going on. And... Uh, they would look at those of us who are more closely associated with the CFDR side as uh, people that came out of the tomb. And one day, Jack Hutchison, who was very brilliant chief engineer at CFDR and also Q and a Scot and a door tough Scottish soldier, he said, you know, we should, the second birthday is coming up, and we should have some fun with Brother Jake and them we decided to get a big rock because we part of the promotional one of our logos showed a big rock uh, with Q104 King of Rock on it. We got a huge huge boulder and we had the rock of the Atlantic spray painted on got a dump truck and a front-end loader and move that sucker right into the mouth of the driveway of C100. The thought was we would leave the rock in the uh, front of the parking lot and the people going in in the morning wouldn't be able to get in they'd get a message from <laughs> q104 i talk about brother jake being confrontational here i am as the president and my brother bill who is the sales manager and the chief engineer were running around at three o'clock in the morning with this big rock so anyway we hired the truck well then i was concerned when we went over we did our monitoring and our surveillance. We went over and found they had a brand new parking lot. They had just asphalted it. So I thought, my God, we'll be sued for damaging it. So we went down to Burgess Transfer and uh, borrowed some cartons with the thought that we'd put all the cartons on the asphalt and then we would launch our rock. This is 3 o'clock in the morning in a quiet neighborhood. The lights were on at uh, the radio station, CJCH. Well, the truck, it was a big dump truck. But when it started to roll the rock down, and we were hoping it was going to land face up, uh, it made so much noise that I'm, the lights went on all over the neighborhood. Well, fortunately, the rock landed as we wanted it to with the Q104 King of Rock showing uh, which would be exposed to the CJCH C100 employees when they came in the morning and part of the ploy and the only person I had let in on this little scheme was um, Al Hollingsworth of the Daily News and promised him a picture so I jumped in front of the rock I had a, a mask on and was all covered up and would be not easily to identify. And Hutch, as the cameraman, shot my picture, and we were going to send this to the Daily News. Well, when we got back to the studios, uh, Q104 CFTR, we had our own dark room in those days, Hutch went in to uh, develop the film, and he came in and he said, My God, I had the shutter closed, and I haven't got a photo. And he said, we'll have to go back and do it again. And I thought, well, we can't go back. We alerted the whole neighborhood. Must have been up for five miles around there with that rock of a sound. We'll be arrested for sure. But we went back, and we got the photo, and we sent it to the Daily News. And the next morning, there's this picture on the front page saying, who is this masked man? And the very next day, 
the very next day, it hit the front page. The Rock of the Atlantic. Gee, who did that? I don't know. <laughs> you know, cops phoning. Did you guys uh, move a rock over there? Oh, my God, we're professionals. Would we do something like that? Absolutely not. Sometime later, I got a friendly call, rather embarrassed call, it seemed, uh, from the then manager of CJCH saying, Arnie, your people have been up to a great prank. And he explained what happened, and he said, you know, they've damaged the parking lot. Well, I said, we'll look out. Well, no, no, he said there was no great damage, but he said it cost us $400 to get that rock towed away. So, uh, of course, they were all mystified. Jake and them didn't know where they were. I accused them. I said, my God, you know, it's one thing to have a little fun, but to drop a, an 1,800-pound rock on the parking lot and impede traffic at the uh, competition station, totally unfair, and, and I'm offended, and if I find out who did it, there's going to be some uh, action taken. Well, no, they were innocent. They couldn't believe, it. and of course, Jack Hutchison and I and Bill, as, as elder men older men were certainly not suspects but it was part of the great fun so we we felt we did it to them and you know this is the first time i've ever told that story i think publicly q104 jocks have never forgotten their station's heritage and acknowledge its history by marking the birthday every november 28th as jake edwards doug Barron, and ray plord remember the first birthday was the most out of control i cut the cake with a chainsaw actually my grandfather's old pool aunt. It's a poo land, Bob. And we would do things like uh, like that. I'm sure that back then, you know, as the magic started to happen around here, that we could do basically anything we wanted, and it would all come off as some clever, entertaining, artistic side of the, of the rockers that worked here. I mean, we did anything, and we laughed. Brother Jake sawed the birthday cake with a chainsaw and hung a moon at the Dal McGinnis room. I couldn't believe it. Here was a program director at a radio station in a crowd full of fans, dropping his trousers and hanging a moon. It was too hilarious. But I remember being at the party with Iron Maiden after their big concert, and Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer for Iron Maiden, was standing around with his little Scottish Shetland cap on and a cane and these big boots, and people weren't even paying attention to him. They were too busy just jumping around with Jake and having fun and stuff really made it uh, made the point of how popular the queue was just by the reaction to that party the people that came out the first birthday and the second birthday i think were the two big ones that's where we really uh, went nuts with the celebration the loudest little one-year-old on the block followed by the very popular loudest little two-year-old on the block campaign as we were leading up to it and during the actual day you know we ran ids that were the loudest little two-year-old and it was uh it was a very cool way of celebrating the birthday we had cakes out in public in both years uh jake with the chainsaw the first year and uh i believe bob with an axe the next year he kind of wanted to follow it up that way and it was always in public always with the audience. The birthday parties were wicked, especially I think the first one when we were celebrating it with the audience and Iron Maiden and Twisted Sister had their tour at the same time, so it was kind of cool to have these celebrities mixing and mingling and drinking up with, uh, with the audience and people from the audience just blown away that they are partying with these people and everything was really relaxed and yet massive, <laughs> 500 people. It's down to hours now. The Iron Maiden Twisted Sister show, the World Slavery Tour, gets underway at 7.30. There might be some tickets left. Listen, that's what I'm trying to do. I, like you, have been wondering, because there are some people who are looking for tickets, if there are any tickets left. Now, I can't get through to the Metro Center at all. I think we're all having the same problem. The, the phone is just not being answered, or there is nobody there to answer it. So if you have just been there and purchased a ticket, or if you're on your way to see if you can purchase one, when you get there, give me a call. Let me know what's going on so I can pass it along, or between the two of us, we can pass along how the ticket sales are going and just what is happening. Because it is there, yesterday there were something like uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 tickets that were uh, freed up or somehow available. Uh, there might be still some left. So if you get to the Metro Center and you get your tickets or to any one of the outlets of uh, the ticket sales, give me a call at 451-1310. Let me know what's going on with ticket sales so we can inform those that are sitting there going, I want to go, I want to go, I found $15, I want to go. Here's what it's going to be like. Here's a sandwich of Iron Maiden and Twisted Sister from who else? Q104FM. <laughs> 
Q104, the Rock of the Atlantic. Party action is happening here. Bob Powers uh, sitting in with uh, John Morgan and Doug Caldwell. Rock and Ray is here. Ah! I... <laughs> That's excellent. He's in Thank fine you. voice. He's in fine voice. The voice of D. Snyder. We are here. And Twisted Sister. And I can't tell you what's on his T-shirt, but you'll probably get a good idea. You say effing over there, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> How's it feel to be in the Maritimes? Oh, it feels great. The Q Air Staff mounted a tongue-in-cheek campaign to get a street in the Burnside Industrial Park named after D. Snyder. Bob Powers recalls that former Dartmouth Mayor Eileen Stubbs was among the city officials who poo-pooed the idea. I still would have liked to have driven down D. Snyder Boulevard. I think, you know, we could have brought him back every few years for, for a reunion. <laughs> it was fun stuff doing that. We helped launch bands, not the only ones that did it, but helped launch bands like Platinum Blonde, Honeymoon Suite, Refugee, uh, Frozen Ghost, so many bands. Kim Mitchell, these are all really good personal friends of this radio station. They were on an open-door policy here. And some bands like The Box, <laughs> regardless of the competition being the sponsor, they always gave us our due and thanked us for our support, which was always appreciated. We supported them and they supported us. That's one of the things I liked about the early Q104, which goes with our programming philosophy, was Canadian. Content was not a drag for us, and homegrown was not a drag for us. They were two of our, our forefront issues, at least as far as Jake Edwards and myself were concerned. Uh, we wanted to do a homegrown project, which was part of our, our original POP, which of course came as a, a feed off of Q107's successful uh, stint into homegrown. Uh, okay, let's get those commercials. All right. Blow those babies out. Range mouth. Q104, it's seven minutes, actually eight minutes after seven o'clock, and uh, we started the set off with cream. And we ended up with the alarm and across the border. And speaking of across the border, while that was on, I went out to uh, the newsroom and I picked up the field glasses that are in there. And I'm just sort of staring across the uh, the water here right now. And it's amazing how you can bring it. Wow, I'm focusing in right now on this apartment building across there. And, uh, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, there's a naked woman in this apartment building. This is great. Wow. No doubt about it. The Rock of the Atlantic Q104 FM. We now go live to the homegrown rock metal light show at the Halifax Forum. And here we go with Stodger time. And if you came here to kick some ass tonight, this band's going to do it for you. So let's bring them on, the heavy rocking sounds of Tyrant. Stand up and rock. Thank you. I get the feeling you guys want to see him one more time. The realist. Is this mic working here? Can no, you, it's not working. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, we're on the radio. Let's uh, let the rest of Metro hear what's happening in here. Let's hear some yell. Let's hear it for you thenics. Steps around the house. I started the Homegrown Project the first week I got here. I said, Arnie, we're going, uh, we're going on board. I'm going to find a studio. I'm going to get some money. I don't, know, I don't know where we're getting the money, but we're doing it. Oh, geez, well, you, you can't. It, I don't, I'm crazy arse. The call me home and get crazy arse. You can't go on and do that. And I remember getting that on, on board, and that was pretty innovative, especially in this market, anywhere in Canada. You know, the Homegrown Project started in 80, 79 and 80, or right across Canada. That's when they really started. So this was 83, and it was pretty, it was pretty advanced for this area, and it went off without a hitch, and we promoted some local talent. Well, obviously, the, the music said it all. You know, the music was the star at the radio station. And the creativity around the radio station and the buzz with the Hal Harbors and the Les Ismores and the, and the misinformations and the Jane Fondles, those, I mean, people had never heard anything like that and still don't hear anything like that. I mean, it was just at that time, was, was, a, was just a, a kind of a time capsule with all these people getting together. And the response was unbelievable. People wanted more of it. They wanted to hear the lunacy. They wanted to hear the, the, the wildness. They wanted to know that they weren't the only ones going out and sitting around in a living room having fun coming up with, with, with jokes and, and uh, different scenarios. I mean, the songs we used to do, Hal and I, we, we would just, we would kill ourselves. I mean, we've got our own album out. Get out the tokens and I paid the man. Money 
has remained committed to local music on its playlist in special features like Tracy Hooper's Indie Waves program from 1995 by the weekly live Rafa Rock showcases in Halifax presented by Q104 and through the homegrown projects which evolved into the Q104 Ultimate Deal awarding the chosen artist a $25,000 recording and promotion package with a major label. All right, 12 minutes after 5 o'clock in the Drive at 5 continues with Honeymoon Suite, New Girl Now at Q104. Andrew Gillis has become an institution at Q104 since he hopped aboard in early 1984. And along with his newspaper background, Andrew's education in English and Canadian Lit and his journalism studies at Carleton lent a unique flavor to the mighty Q. After a year or so at the Daily News, uh, Q104 was starting up, and I had some musical acquaintance with uh, Doug Barron, who was already hired on as the morning sidekick and news director, so he needed some people who knew a little bit about music and who could talk, or at least write, and uh, yeah, ran into him in a bar. He offered me a job here. It promised to be promised to be better paying than the newspaper business. It was not. You know, this uh, swinging type of music is, uh, Paul Schaefer would say, swinging, swinging. Yeah, that's right. Paul would love this, wouldn't he? Yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, on TV they've got interludes, you know, like a New Brunswick moment. Right. And they show you reversing falls or something. <laughs> and you just have to go to the bathroom once you see that. <laughs> Hey, did you see, uh, speaking of uh, interludes in New Brunswick. <laughs> yes. Did you see uh, Casey Irving made it back to St. John? They gave him a uh, right. key to the city. Right. <laughs> as if he needed it. He owns the city, he right? Owns. They gave it to him saying yeah, what, what great things he's done. And and I guess uh, they whisked him away. The uh, right. Revenue Canada was <laughs> checking out the books and everything. Yeah. Typical KC. Yeah, he was, he was limping in there. He lives in Bermuda now. Swinging place. All right, kind of mellow. I got, I got that, uh, a real big kick out of that. Uh, St. John New Brunswick gave him a key to the city and a, an award, you know? That is, that's incredible. Do I have that here? No, I guess I don't. That was yesterday. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, amazing stuff. The old man was, was in there, and uh, he was stumbling through his speech, and I think I he's know. had too much, uh, you know, time in the sun. It's okay. We're not owned by Irving here, are we? No, no, oh, we're no. not. No. <laughs> no, gosh. No, I guess not. Yeah. And anyway, and yeah, you're a little bit sunbaked, eh? Yeah, I think so. Too much sun, too much golfing. Gosh. You know? Yeah. Well, us here in the East are breaking our backs at the refineries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, where's KC? I don't know. Knee deep in Bunker yeah. C. <laughs> I was hired to do okay, uh, well, news time here at the half a week in weekends. And, uh, so the three office days... We prepared a show called Metro Magazine. I got laid off. Arnie Patterson in a cutback mode, possibly because the heavy metal hadn't sold so well. And it came back the summer of 85, after about six months off of there, uh, to fill in for Brenda Oland when Wayne got married and left the afternoon shift open. So at that point, she was sidekicking for Andy Kay. Um, Andy and I uh, got going. We battled strenuously over uh, True North, Canada's America's Cup challenger, which was clipping down the harbor. And I, as a local boy who used to bum around, you know, private clubs where there were sailboats, not as a member, but as a, an interloper. Uh, you know, I was all excited. The sailboat was going by. You know, if was John Buchanan's government had kicked in a million dollars or something like that, that was enough for Andy Kay. He heard that, and he hit the roof. And there was a real tense scene on the air that went on as I jocularly said, hey, Andy, this is like a month into it, late 85, I guess. Hey, Andy, look at that. Look at that true north out there. Sailing against the wind, it's going like it's on a conveyor belt, like there's a sub tow in it. Look at that damn thing. Uh, and uh, Andy said, you're, you're kidding, right? Or <laughs> something like that. Looked over, kidding, right? Dead air. He said, no, Andy, I'm not kidding. That's true north. Oh, the boys are out there getting ready. Yeah, they, they might do us proud. Who knows? It might be a big surprise. <laughs> More dead air. Andy goes, less, as he called me. Less, he goes. You've got to be kidding. Uh, at this point, my honor handle was less is more. 
where Andy uh, basically oh, yeah, no, stopped the show dead a yeah. couple of times there and wanted to register that he thought it was completely wrong that a million dollars of tax money should go into a sailboat. And I must say, you know, on the Buchanan uh, budget check, maybe Andy might have had something there. <laughs> I began to feel not so good about it later. So, uh, but Andy had a great collection of 45s. He used to do a 5 o'clock flashback show. Remember uh, Andy's big tune was... Uh, Ooh, just give me some kind of sign. Brenton Wood, 66, AM classic. Spiral Staircase, more today than yesterday. You love, used to play that one off, 45. Uh, so uh, Andy was, he kind of had a, an R&B-tinged uh, 60s pop collection there, and I remember listening to that stuff on, under my pillow on CJCH and occasionally CHNS. CJ was a little heavier of the little uh, more soulful of the AM stations there in the evenings in Nova Scotia like in 66, 67, 68, 69. So I was 10, 11 years old and I was me just memorizing that stuff. Uh, so Andy was a bit of a flash, but what's more I remember him actually having been a CJ personality at one point. So I was like, well, this is, this is odd. Definitely. Meanwhile, parent team Edmonton Oilers are off to a fast 4-0 start in the NHL. Back in a moment with a Q-tip and a music note. Hi there, friend. Q104. We're back. This is the sound of Q News and the Drive at 5 with the two Andys, Andy K and me on the other Andy. And uh, we're just going to have a quick look at the weather. But if you're around town tonight, uh, check out Willie Hop at the Wooden Nickel. We didn't mention them last time. And uh, last times tonight for uh, the uh, fabulous movie, This is Spinal Tap, the rockumentary at uh, Wormwood Theater down on Barrington. Well, what about Gingers? Gingers? <laughs> Everybody knows who's playing there, Andy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, okay, well... Andy we're Kay's we're collection of solid gold 45s, from which he proudly drew the daily 5 o'clock flashbacks, also had an important significance in Canada's rock radio heritage. And he had inherited the records from the old C. Fox Montreal Library when it became CKO in the mid-1970s. As for Andrew Gillis's on-air moniker, Doug Barron recalls. We toyed with the, with the idea of, of Andrew being my cousin. We had uh, Hal Harbor. We thought of originally calling him Coal Harbor, but we settled on Less Is More, the minimal, minimalist news guy. Uh, well, we're going to go right now and get the award presentation for Bimbo of the Year. Okay, let's go to the Q phone right now. Hello. Hi. Hi. Bimbo Rock nomination. Prince, definitely. Yeah? But, you know, you got him on your q for Rock poster. It's February. A, yeah, but February is National Dartboard Month. Andrew yeah. Gillis has a talent for combining hard news and serious editorial comment with a bizarre sense of humor and a searing wit. His knowledge of the city and his musical background are two strong assets that help account for Andrew's continued appeal. Maintaining the newsman bluesman status is one of Q104's strongest performers to this day, Ray Plourd. Andrew Gillis is one of the most genuinely quirky funny guys I know. He's not like a comedian. He just has a quirky, off-slant way of looking at things, and it makes him a great afternoon newsman, because he, he can do the news thing, the straight news thing, here's the facts and information, but he has such an odd way of looking at things that I think in a way he can diffuse a news story with a, with a quick little quip or, or just something happening in the community, and he is genuinely funny. I genuinely enjoy listening to... Uh, to his okay, slants on life, and when he brought that to the radio, I thought it was uh, it was perfect. He really never came from a radio background, and maybe that's what makes him so innocently charming and and real. I love uh, listening to Andrew. He's also a hell of a blues player, blues harp player. Hey, hey, great award ceremony. I, I, for me, the sentimental favorite, Wham and Michael Jackson for Bingo yeah. of the Year. Wham uh, tops my list. It tops you, but but really, in total number of votes, I believe Cindy Lauper was ahead there by one, ahead of Boy George. Boy George rallied in the late hours, but Cindy Lauper is the one with the least brain of all our nominees. No, as far as we can tell. I think if we go back to the phone lines very quickly, we'll get Wham. You think you, we can get a decisive? Uh, yeah, I think Wham. Four five one thirteen ten. Um, okay. You, yeah, I don't think Boy George should get that. Maybe mm. Faggot of the Year or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Well, didn't he say he was the uh, biggest uh, drag queen of them all on uh, uh, yeah. network TV? I think he. I think our caller though means biggest bundle of sticks of the year. <laughs> Q104. Wham. Yeah. Who is that blatant fag anyway? The lead singer of Wham. He's got to go. Yeah. Oh, George Michael. 
George Michael. He's gone. Oh. Bye bye. Yank. He's, uh, just uh, just too much. George Michael, Bob Gainey, two minutes hooking. So th there's two for Wham. Double right minus, there. five minutes. Get him out of the game. Referee Bruce Hood has called him out. Wham. Wham. Tops to list. Wham is at Bimbo's of the year. Wake me up before you goo goo. Oh, sorry. Yes. Dreadfully sorry. And, uh, hey, we'd like to get right now into the weather because it's 532 at the Mighty Q. All right. Ba, ba, ba. The Environment Canada Orchestra indicating that we'll have cold, brisk northwest winds overnight. Lows tonight, minus 12 to minus 16. Sunny with cloudy periods Friday. Highs minus 3 to minus 6. The Through the mid-1980s, afternoon listeners to Q104 heard the two Andes walk the line of good taste from time to time. But freedom was in the air and on the air. And Andy K knew Freeform Radio. I think when I left CJCH in the 70s, I went to CJFM in Montreal, which was all Freeform. And I did the evening show there. And then uh, later on, I went to Shome. And uh, I mentioned the all-night show because that was uh, one of my favorite shifts to do because uh, all nights you could get away with almost anything. The only memo I remember getting from uh, Jake was that there was a party at his place and you had to attend. But uh, certainly um, there was a lot of freedom. And uh, looking back on it now, it was kind of saying, well, you could have restrained yourself in this way and in that way, but... It was great for the listeners. That's what I, I loved about it, because they had never heard this type of radio before in Halifax. And uh, I loved doing it. Of course, we always got um, uh, criticized by the newspapers, uh, different churches uh, that were just kind of freaking out in some of the things that, uh, that we would do. I used to have some features on, uh, on the afternoon show. Remember the Leather Weather Girl? <laughs> well, you see, I, I wasn't just picking on, like, women or leather or whatever. I happened to meet a girl, I think, at the Misty Moon. And she was, like, leather from head to toe, and she was a real Q104 fan. And she would call me up in the afternoons, and I remembered her, her calls. And um, so we just, you know, I just tied her into the show. <laughs> tied her into the show. Um, so she came on as the Leather Weather Girl. And uh, then we had other features. I guess it was the 330 Locker Search. And uh, we turned that into a search for your favorite album cut. Um, and what was the other thing? I do remember one time, and I, I do think I, I did make a mistake, but um, Mary Ann Faithful, why'd you do it? I don't know if you're familiar with that cut or not. But um, I happened to play that, and the phones went nuts, okay? My phone's in the studio going crazy. Switchboard downstairs, they're getting calls from mothers who are listening, because their kids have got the radio on, they're going, oh, you know, can't believe you're playing that. And uh, any other concerned citizen, um, also from the record stores going, we're getting calls from people who want to buy this record. What label is it on? We want to order. And uh, then I remember Bob Powers flying into the, uh, <laughs> into the studio. And uh, Bob, who's really, uh, you know, one of the nicest guys I've ever met in the industry personally, but was the music director at that time, I believe. And... Uh, was ultra serious. He was taking these calls from, I guess, parents or whatever, and he was freaking out, and he had to call Jake, and uh, I heard from Jake, and Jake is laughing, right? We had such a freestyle mentality here. I'll never forget the day we were, Jake and I were driving in the car. At 3 o'clock, Andy Kay came on the air, and he played Why'd You Do It by Marion Faithful, which has some pretty explicit sexual references in there, and we literally hit a payphone, and you know, we appreciated the uh, avant-garde nature of his decision, but we still had to say, Andy, what are you doing? You know, do you want to be here tomorrow? Because that was pretty much over the line at that point for Halifax Dartmouth to hear that, those words on the air. Andrew Gillis has done more than double duty over his years at the station. He hosted the Sunday Night Blues Show, known originally as Blue Still Midnight, then R&B and U, and finally, the blues-related incident. This incident is believed to be blues-related. From Q104.
when Q104's Talk of the Atlantic was scaled back to one hour a week and renamed q Communication. That, too, was Andrew's chance to relate to the audience one-to-one -one and take on some hot topics. Remember one show in which Yvonne Atwell, spokesman for the Afro-Canadian Caucus in Nova Scotia, was on. Rocky Jones, who once upon a time brought the Black Panthers to Nova Scotia, was on. After I myself had been a little bit involved in a news story in which a band I was playing in called the Spin Doctors, a name which I thought I owned, had been fired from a gig. There were a couple of black players in the band, and we determined, to the best of our ability, that this is how it had happened. There followed a nasty letter of complaint from the bar owners to say, hey, the guy who did a show speaking about racism in bars in downtown Halifax is a guy who's in this band. He's got a vested interest in running such a show. Jim McLeod, who was the, uh, at that point, was the new president of uh, New Cap Broadcasting, listened to the tape, and he felt okay with it. My concern would be for the black musicians. It seems like more of them are working. So that show was going on at a time when there was some kind of impetus building. We had people call in and say that, uh, that they'd been on uh, dates with black people, male and female, uh, and uh, had been refused entry at bars of great reputation. Those names went on the air of those bars. show was on delay at the time, and I had already had my live guests refer to previous incidents that had gone to the Human Rights Commission, so I left the names of the other bars in as well. It just seemed that to take them all out would just kind of be cutting something basic out of the story. Maybe some compensation rather than $300,000 or $3 million would be if this movie, Justice Denied, was shown in every grade six classroom across Canada for free. Yeah, that's sort of an educational tool. I can see it. It's our own black like me. Coming up in part five of our look back, a station in transition grows up and the audience grows with it.